Got to have a Bible. Which might need that. <laughs> okay, well, let's go before the Lord. You hear me all right? Do I need to move this? Yeah, yeah what? Is that better? As long as I speak really loud, it's better? All right, Father God, we come before you in Jesus' name. We are thankful that we can call you Father. We didn't have a relationship with you until we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And for the fathers here, I just want to encourage them, and that's that you would encourage me also to remind us that you build families, and you've given the position of leadership to the Father. And the Father leads by following, following Jesus, who is leading us to you. So we ask that you would strengthen and, and comfort the fathers as we walk with you, be it imperfectly, yet day by day being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, that we would lead our families by example, by word, and that may you be glorified in our lives. And whether we be husbands or wives or widows or orphans or whatever, we all have a Father in heaven who is perfect and who loves us. And we honor you. We thank you. We thank you for the word that you've given to us. We ask that you'd give us the gift of teaching that we would understand your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so if you join me in Acts chapter 26, verse by verse study continues last week, obviously, in chapter 25. Uh, we saw that after two years, there was a change of Roman administration in Judea, but Paul remained in prison. And the new governor, a guy named Festus, uh, realized that he had a dilemma. He didn't know what to do with Paul. And in the course of that, he ended up, Paul ended up appealing to Caesar, which complicates things for Festus. And so now moving forward into chapter 26, Paul is going to stand before King Agrippa II, as well as all the who's who of the Romans in Caesarea. And chapter 26 is a, a tale of two hearts and a tale of two tragedies. The two hearts are a zealous, hard heart of a raging antichrist and a zealous, soft heart of a pleading servant of Christ. And the two tragedies are the reactions to that heart. One essentially is, you know, that's just crazy talk. And the other one is, oh, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Both tragic. And I think what happens in this chapter we can all relate to. I know I can, and I, I believe everyone who is following Jesus can relate to what's happening in this chapter. So, with that, starting in verse 1, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be expert in all the customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. At the end of the last chapter, Festus was making the introductory remarks for this regal setting. Uh, he's handed the proceedings over to King Agrippa, who in turn has given the floor to Paul. And Paul's extending his hand to the one that he's addressing. And there's a bunch of people in the room, but he's primarily addressing King Agrippa. And he says to him, I consider myself very fortunate, actually, to defend myself before you because you're well-versed in the Hebrew Scriptures. According to Josephus, Herod Agrippa II was well-versed in the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, Paul recognized that. Uh, and he says, King, you know, you're also very knowledgeable on the Jewish culture, uh, the Jewish religious debates, which never seem to end, and the different sects of Judaism. You have an understanding of me and us. This is not spoken. You have an understanding of me and us that these guys don't. Because what has Paul been doing for the last two years when it comes to defending himself? He's speaking to Romans. First, in Jerusalem, it was the chief captain. Then in Caesarea, it was Felix, multiple times. 
And now, again, still in Caesarea, it's Festus. They're all heathen. They're ignorant of the inseparable issues that Paul and the Jews who accuse him have. And the issues are twofold. First is the resurrection from the dead, which is the very heart and the power of the gospel. And inseparable, inseparable from that is the issue of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, Agrippa is more informed than these Romans, and so Paul says, please hear me out. But there's another reason, I think, why Paul would be excited to stand before this king, because when he got his calling from the Lord on the road to Damascus, he was told that he would bear his name before Gentiles and kings and before Israel. In Psalm 119, verse 46, the word says, I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. The word of God is alive. And Paul is living it. And so no doubt he's excited for this opportunity. And he's going to lay out the gospel for Agrippa. Verse 4, my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify, that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. So Paul starts his defense with who he was. He was a Pharisee, a member of the most conservative and the most strictest sect in Judaism. In fact, as he testified in uh, Jerusalem, he's the son of a Pharisee. He's a legacy Pharisee, and he was born in Tarsus, but sometime as a boy, he was sent to Jerusalem to be among his people, which are the Jews, and to sit under the esteemed teacher of the law named Gamaliel. And what he's saying to Agrippa here, his, his story, his backstory, common knowledge to the Jews. They all knew that. They knew him. They knew who he was. Verse 6, but that was then and this is now. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. So Paul is standing before, he's accused and condemned by the Jews for believing, as he says here, the hope of the promise made of God to our fathers, communicated through the law and the prophets. Uh, and this hope, the promise of God, is those inseparable promises, those inseparable issues that are the source of the contention between Paul and the Jews. The, the promise of the Messiah in the law and in the prophets. He's called the seed of the woman. That's not natural, that's supernatural. God promised to fix the sin problem of Adam and Eve supernaturally through one of their own, if you will. And so it, it's a very early and vague, because it's early, a declaration that the, the solution to man's sin problem is going to be the Son of God and the Son of Man, as revealed through the righteous line that starts with Adam, and then Seth, and then Noah, and then Shem, then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David, and that's all by faith, righteousness which is by faith. In, in the, the law, he's called the star out of Jacob. In the law, he's called Shiloh. He's called the lion of Judah. He's the son of David. In the prophets, he's the ruler that comes from everlasting, the ruler in Israel that comes from everlasting. He comes from eternity to Israel. In the prophets, his name is Emmanuel which means God with us. He's going to be born of a virgin. He is named Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's who the Messiah is, as God told Israel through the law and the prophets. 
Paul has a hope, as do the Jews, that God's going to make good on his word. But also the other hope, the other promise of God is the resurrection of the dead. Uh, one of the very earliest books in the Bible is the book of Job. We all know his story, uh, but in chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, he, he's crying out to the Lord. He says, for I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself. And mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. The promise of the resurrection proclaimed by Job in the very beginning. The prophet Daniel said in the latter times, uh, Michael, the archangel, he's going to stand up uh, for the people of Israel. And it will be when there's a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. It's speaking of a time yet future, maybe not too distant, but yet future. And at that time, thy people will be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them shall, that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. The resurrection of the dead. God has promised that through the law and the prophets. And Paul is accused, he is condemned by the Jews for believing what God said. Believing the hope of Israel. So what gives? Why the contention between Paul and the Jews who both believe in these promises from God? Well, Paul believes that the hope, the Messiah, the resurrection of the dead, he believes that hope has come in Jesus Christ and in his resurrection. The Jews, on the other hand, uh, they believe it will come. Notice Oh, there it is, middle of verse 7. Unto which promise are twelve tribes instantly serving God and day and night hope to come. The, belie the, the Jews believe that the Messiah is going to come. The resurrection is going to come. Hasn't come yet. Which means, nope, Jesus is not the Christ, the Son, the living God. And nope, he, he was not raised from the dead. They deny all those things. So it, the, the conflict has everything to do with Jesus. Verse 8. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Remember, Paul extended his hand to Agrippa. He's speaking directly to Agrippa. He's speaking personally to Agrippa. And he pointedly asks him why he who is familiar with the Hebrew Scriptures, why would he think it incredible, meaning untrustworthy or not believable? Why would he think it not believable that God should raise the dead? It's a rhetorical question. He's not looking for an answer from Agrippa. It's as if he's saying, you know, it goes without saying, King Agrippa, that God raises the dead, right? And, and he moves on. But here we have so far in, in Paul's account uh, his, his backstory, verses 4 and 5, was common knowledge of the Jews. They knew him. Uh, they knew how he was. And the Jews loved Saul of Tarsus. But they hate Paul the Apostle. And they accuse him and condemn him for believing in what God has said and done. And this is the very issue that I... And I dare say every one of you has with unbelieving loved ones. Uh, speaking personally, you know, my loved ones that do not believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son, living God, do not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They knew me before I knew Jesus. They knew me for 34 years. They had decades of history with me how I thought, how I spoke, how I lived. And all of a sudden, it's all different. Uh, and they don't get it. They don't believe it. And they not, 
maliciously per se, not savagely, not even disrespectfully most times, uh, they stand in judgment of my hope in what God has promised <laughs> uh, and what he has done for me. God has nailed pre-Jesus dug to the cross of Christ. He has forgiven me of all my sins. They are as far as east is from the west. And he has made me, I didn't make myself, he made me dead to sin and alive to God. That's what God has done. Uh, but because they don't believe what God has said, uh, they think that God raising from someone from the dead is uh, incredible. It's not trustworthy. Uh, it's unbelievable. In fact, they don't believe, even believe in God. They're atheists. We, they're agnostics. We were raised in the Roman church. It drove us all away. All away. Out in, it drove me into the world. But there's pain and suffering in the world, and that pain and suffering drew me to the foot of the cross. They're out there still. They're atheists, they're agnostics. They're without faith in a creator, even. They've rejected the revelation of God that he's given of himself to them. Scripture says that without faith it's impossible to please him, and that he that comes to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that dil diligently seek him. They don't believe that he is. So they're not diligently seeking him. Therefore, there's no faith. There's no pleasing. God is not pleased with my, with many of my loved ones. And they, they don't believe that God raises people from the dead. So what do they believe? Uh, they believe that after death, nothing. There's nothing. Life is over. That's all there is. But I believe what God has said. Jesus said, For as the Father raises the dead and quickens them, even so the Son quickens whom he will. I believe that. Jesus said uh, that they, people will come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I believe that. Jesus asked one woman, Martha, I, and said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoso liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? I do. And so to believe, that's good. And that leads to the resurrection unto life. To not believe is evil, but leads to the resurrection of damnation. So I believe what God has said. And my unbelieving loved ones think I'm kind of absurd and simple-minded in that way. Verse 9. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things, <coughs> excuse me, many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them off in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Paul says, this is who I was, and now this is the situation, and then he, what's the difference? He segues into his personal testimony. He was a zealous, hard-hearted, raging antichrist, as he so testified to and reminded the churches in Galatia. That letter he wrote to them uh, in chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, he said, for you have heard of my conversation, my lifestyle, in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, 
and profited in the Jews' religion above many of my equals in my own nation, being, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. He gave the same testimony to the Jews in Jerusalem when they saw him in the temple and they wanted to rip him to shreds, uh, trying to kill him. Uh, he was given an opportunity to share his testimony. He said the very same thing. You know, I, I know where you're coming from because I was just like you. I thought just like you. And the Jews know that full well. They know who he was. They knew how he fought, and they loved him for it. But, you know, and, you know, that even included voting for their execution. Stephen, right? After an inspired Bible study, they stoned him. Paul's holding the coats. Oh, and apparently uh, others were killed also. We don't have their names, but he saw to it that they were killed also. Uh, he even hunted Christians far and wide, not only in Judea, not only in Samaria, but also into Gentile cities, including Damascus, which, starting verse 12, whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw the way, saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So this licensed hunter is on his way to Damascus to get some of these people and bring them back to Jerusalem to be punished. And this raging antichrist became the target of a spotlight from heaven, brighter than the noonday sun. And he became the target of someone speaking directly, personally, and exclusively to him because the conversation was in Hebrew. And from the other accounts, we know that others with him heard the voice, but they didn't understand what was being said because the conversation was in Hebrew. And the voice asked him a piercing question and made a very convicting statement about his life. The piercing question is this zealous persecution of the followers of Jesus of Nazareth was taken quite personally by this voice speaking out of heaven. Why are you persecuting me? Oh, wow. But then the voice makes a statement that convicts Paul, Saul of Tarsus, his heart, I think his heart and his mind were rattled. He was unsettled in his heart, his soul, maybe even his spirit by Stephen. The wisdom of Stephen, his, his teaching and his testimony. When, when Stephen and, and, and others were spirit-filled guys set to minister to the people, uh, Jews came against him. And in Acts chapter 6, verse 10, it says, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. They couldn't, they were no match for Stephen in a conversation relative to the things of God. He had great wisdom, which of course comes with the Holy Spirit. And then they called him before the council, and he very wisely takes them through the pattern in Scripture about first and second comings, if you will. And when he was done, uh, he said, Behold, I see heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And the council lost their mind, and they stoned him. And as he was dying, he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, Lay not this sin to their charge. And we had said this, he fell asleep. 
watching, listening, all of this with Saul of Tarsus. And it rattled him. And this voice from heaven knew this and testified to Saul that he had been shaken by Stephen, yet he's been hard-heartedly fighting against the truth that he heard and he saw that day. Saul has been opposing himself. He's been rebelling against the, the pricks, the goads of the good shepherd, the, the master who's pricking his heart with the truth and with the conviction of sin. And now he's called out on it. The voice from heaven has revealed his heart, what's in his heart. Uh, and I think we all have loved ones who are kicking against the goads of the master who's long-suffering, wants them to come to the knowledge of the truth. He doesn't want them to perish. He wants them to come to repentance. But they're kicking against the goads. Verse 15. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. So, the target of a spotlight, the target of a voice, the only natural question is, who are you? What's the name? What's the name of the voice? It can only be the Lord God. The, the English word there, Lord, underneath it is the Greek word kurios, which means supreme authority. From the earlier account, we know that the conversation is in Hebrew. The Hebrew equivalent would be Adonai, which is how the God of Israel was personally addressed. He knows he's personally addressing the God of Israel. Who are you? What is your name? I am, ding, 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 Jesus. I am the one of whom Stephen testified. You heard that testimony. You didn't believe it. You've been kicking against it. Uh, and who you are persecuting is me. Because me and my own are one. Verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a, wit and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. So the Lord revealed Paul's heart. And he revealed his identity to Paul. And now he's revealing to Paul his plan for his life. And it begins with a what? What are you going to be? I'm going to make you a minister. I'm going to make you a servant. Which can only happen after you've had a good old helping of humble pie. And I'm going to make you a witness. I'm going to make you a witness of the things that you've seen today. This light, the voice. You're going to be a witness of these things. And here we are downstream sometime. He's doing that. He's doing that before King Agrippa. He's done it before. He's doing it again now. He goes, but I'm also going to make you witness of the things to be revealed to you in the future. And... Paul spoke of that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, he says, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. I'm going to make you a servant. Here's a piece of humble pie. You're going to like it. And I'm going to keep serving you humble pie. I'm going to keep you humble. All right, to whom is this calling of Paul? Verse 17, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee. Delivering them means to tearing you out of. He, I'm going to tear you out of the hands of the Jews. I'm going to tear you out of the hands of the Gentiles. I'm going to deliver you because both of them are going to try to kill you. Jews and Gentiles are going to try to kill you, which, of course, is played out in, in Paul's ministry. But I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. He'll be known as the apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, verse 18, 
What's the purpose in being a minister? What's the purpose of being a witness? What's the purpose of being sent to the Gentiles to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. This is my plan for your life. This is what I'm going to do through you. I'm going to open their eyes, heal their spiritual blindness. In Isaiah chapter 35, verses 4 and 6, 4 through 6, rather, uh, the prophet recorded, Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance against the spiritual enemy. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. Those are things that Jesus did during his ministry. Evidence that he was the Messiah. In fact, when the, the disciples of John the Baptist came and said, uh, Are you the one that we're supposed to be looking for? Jesus quoted this verse. He'd been doing this. He'd been doing it physically. He was also doing spiritually. But the work that began continued after he ascended back to the right hand of the Father and the Holy Spirit came and the church was born. Out they went to continue the work. And there, of course, were miracles. But the miracle is a spiritual one. To heal their spiritual blindness. And Paul wrote about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is, in the, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. What is the spiritual problem of my unbelieving loved ones? A blinded mind. In Ephesians, we're told that the Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Blinded mind, blinded heart, blinded eyes are going to open their eyes. I'm going to turn them from darkness to light. Darkness, lies, and unbelief that kill the spirit to light, truth, and faith that enliven the spirit. Darkness, hatred that darkens the soul to love that enlightens the soul. In Colossians chapter, 20, or Colossians chapter 1, we're told that he's delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son who is the way, the life, and the truth. In him is the life of men, and that life is light. I'm going to turn them from the power of Satan unto God, from eternal death to eternal life. We read in Hebrews chapter 2 that Jesus took part of the flesh uh, because the descendants of Adam and Eve uh, are mankind. And so he became partakers of the flesh and blood uh, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. I'm going to turn them from the power of Satan to the power of God. The power of God is the resurrection unto eternal life. That going on, what, what else? Uh, they're going to receive the forgiveness of sins. Uh, grace. Peter, when he was addressing the crowd in Jerusalem in the very early days of the church, in Acts chapter 3, verse 26, he said, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning, turning away every one of you from his iniquities. 
the turn from sin to God. And we're, it, it, it's, that's God's grace in action. And by grace are we saved through faith. And that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Oh, and they're, finally, they're going to receive inheritance. The inheritance is eternal life. They're going to receive inheritance from among them that are sanctified. To be sanctified is to be made holy, is to be set apart for God's purpose. How are they sanctified? How are we sanctified? By faith. Trusting Jesus. Leaning on Jesus. The gospel of Christ. What is the gospel of Christ? Romans chapter 1. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just, the sanctified, uh, shall live, inheritance, shall live by faith. In Romans chapter 3, verse 22, the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. So, verse, moving on, verse 19, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. So hearing Jesus speak to him personally, first asking him a very piercing question, and then making a statement about him that revealed the contents of his heart, and then recommissioning his, his, his life, what did Paul say to King Agrippa about what he did? I, well, I believed. I obeyed. No hesitation, no argument, no negotiation. He said, go, I went. What happened? Jesus offered Saul of Tarsus the gift of repentance, and Saul accepted it. Saul had an encounter with the living God. He had an encounter with Jesus, and he was radically and forever changed. He is no longer a zealous, hard-hearted, raging antichrist, but he is a zealous, soft-hearted servant of Christ. He's not the persecutor anymore. He's the preacher. He's not the hunter anymore. He's the hunted. And where did that happen? Right where he was. Starting in Damascus, then he got back to Jerusalem, and he went beyond there. And everywhere he went, he preached repentance toward God. Think differently. Have a right mind. Turn to God. Turn to face the Son. And be a doer of the Word, not hearers only. The, the things that you do are, are proof of the change that's been accomplished by God. The things that you do don't make you pleasing to God. Believing what God has said and God has done, that makes Him pleased. And evidence of that is what you do. You've been preaching that everywhere. Verse 21, for these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And Paul is now saying, because of the intervention of, by Jesus Christ in my life, by the calling of God put upon my life, and by my obedience to the calling of God, I got shanghaied in the temple and almost killed. That's resulted in all of this. But God, but God helped me. God helped Paul with escape and protection and giving him the very best spiritual gift that he needs, giving him his words to say when he needs them to be said. He made, God made good on his promise in verse 17 to deliver him from the people and from the Gentiles. And now with God's help, 
Paul is saying, I continue to be faithful to my calling. In spite of all the trouble, in spite of all the suffering, I know what God told me to do, I'm doing it. And so he witnesses to everyone because it is God's heart that all would come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. And besides, he's not spouting off his opinion. He's not rambling on about some philosophy or some tradition of men. What he's preaching is the word of God. What the law and the prophets said and what they foretold about the Christ and they foretold that Christ must suffer. Where? Well, Genesis 22, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, Daniel chapter 9, the Christ must suffer and he must be the first fruits of the resurrection unto eternal life. And he must declare the light of God's truth to both the Jews and the Gentiles. That's what's been said by Moses. That's what was said by the prophets. That's what Paul's saying to the people. He is sharing the word of God. Our loved ones that don't believe Jesus is the Christ or the Son, the Son of the living God, do they need to hear our opinion? No. No, they need to hear what God said. They need to hear what God has done. They might even need to hear what God is going to do. Think back on Paul's testimony to Felix. He was called back in and preached of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come. And Felix trembled. Maybe they need to hear that. Verse 24. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. So up to this point, Festus has just been sitting there listening, but he's not understanding. He's not spiritually discerning. And boom, he erupts. Paul, you are a raving maniac. All that holy book learning of yours has made you crazy. That's a very tragic response to, being, to hearing what God has said about Jesus and the resurrection of the dead. It's as if Festus said, you know, this is just crazy talk. Well, you want crazy? How about this for crazy? You mentioned it on Wednesday night. Tuesday this last week. I just want to read it. Uh, a top official with the World Economic Forum has called for religious scripture to be rewritten by artificial intelligence to create a globalized new Bible. And it's got his name there. Eh, it doesn't matter. But he is a senior advisor to the chairman, and he argues that using AI to replace scriptures will create unified, get this wording, religions that are actually correct. He said, uh, the power of AI can be harnessed and used to reshape spirituality into whose vision? A man's vision. Yeah. He said, this is the first technology ever that can create new ideas. The printing press, radio, television, they broadcast, they spread the ideas created by the human brain, by the human mind. They cannot create a new idea. You know, Gutenberg printed the Bible in the middle of the 15th century. The printing press printed out as many copies of the Bible as Gutenberg instructed it, but it did not create a single new page. It had no ideas of its own about the Bible. Is it good? Is it bad? How to interpret it? How to interpret that? AI, on the other hand, AI can create new ideas. It can create a new, it can write a new Bible. Quote, throughout history, religions dreamt about having a book written by a supernatural intelligence, by a non-human entity, 
In a few years, there might be religions that are actually correct. Just think about a religion whose holy book is written by AI, and that could be a reality in a few years. How's that for a strong delusion? There's a strong delusion coming upon the earth. How's that one? That's pretty intense. Uh, during the time of the counterfeit Christ, there's one world government and there's one world religion. How's that going to happen? Is this going to happen? I don't know. That's crazy talk. Because we have words that come from a supernatural intelligence. People just don't believe it. It's bizarre the times in which we live. Anyway, coming back to, yeah, absolute blasphemy. <clears throat> coming back to the words of the living God, verse 30, 20, 25. But he, that would be Paul, said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. See, Paul had been a raving maniac. <laughs> but he's not now. He's in his right mind. And so when he's accused of being a raving maniac, he go, no, 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 no. These are not, my words are not the words of a madman. These are the words of God, the words of truth and right-mindedness. And he speaks of King Agrippa, who has a knowledge, a working knowledge of the law and the prophets. Uh, and he says to Festus, Agrippa knows these things. What I'm saying, Agrippa knows these things. After all, God didn't do anything in a corner. He didn't do anything in secret. But he did what he did in plain sight before whomsoever would see. For the eyes that would see. Then he turns to King Agrippa, verse 27. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Now my professional training uh, was in, believe it or not, in technology. I am so far behind. I, 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 technology befuddles me now. But... My professional training when I got out of college was technology. And I was in technical sales assist, and then I got into sales because there was more money in it, <laughs> quite honestly. And so I read this in that frame of reference. What's Paul doing? He's asking for the order. He wants to close the deal. Do you believe the prophets of God? And then he gives a presumptive close. Oh, I know that you believe. So, sign on the dotted line, kind of a thing. Verse 28, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Wow! How painfully tragic are those words. Paul, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. That was a very good presentation. That's a nice little convincing speech you gave me, but I ain't buying what you're selling. And what is Paul selling? Verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in Jesus. That's what he's offering. And Agrippa says, I ain't buying it. Agrippa made a choice. He wanted his sin instead of God's salvation from sin. He wanted eternal death rather than eternal life. He wanted darkness rather than light. And that resonates in me personally also. To hear those words, you almost convinced me to be a Christian. Uh, one of my sons... Uh, does not believe. Uh, he was over at our house for Thanksgiving a number of years ago. And we had a wonderful conversation out on the back patio. Really, he opened up for, for the first time. I've been working on him, working on him. He opened up for the first time. And after a couple hours, he went away. And he sidled up alongside another one of my sons and said, you know, dad's a very smart guy. He answered all my questions. He answered all my objections. And it makes me mad. Does not believe. 
will not see. Blinded mind, blinded heart. As if he said he almost persuaded me to be a Christian. And I've got a sibling whom I mentioned last week, not last week, last month, when I talked to her. And, and she's, she's atheist. Um, she acknowledged in the course of our conversation that the world is all messed up and mankind has no answers. Mankind cannot fix it. Well, would you like to hear about my hope in who can stop right there? Keep it to yourself. I don't want to hear it. The unbelievers choose sin over God's salvation for sin. They choose eternal death over eternal life. They choose darkness instead of light. It's tragic. Verse 29, and Paul said, I would to God, not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am except these bonds. This zealous, soft-hearted servant of Christ is pleading with Agrippa and all those are in the room. I pray to God that all of you, not just almost, but completely and wholeheartedly surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and follow him just as I have. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ye must be born again of the Spirit of God. Be ye reconciled to God. He's pleading with them. There's two tragedies in the audience. Festus. You know, that's just crazy talk, Paul. Then Agrippa, you almost, almost persuaded to me, persuaded me to be a, a Christian. Grieved Paul. It grieves God. It grieves me. It grieves you. But God is still working, is he not? All our unbelieving loved ones, they still have breath. God is still working. So there's hope. And that takes me to... Uh, my father on this Father's Day when he was dying. I was 40 years old, living in Southern California. They lived in Oklahoma. I came out to see him knowing it's going to be the last time. And he and I were sitting in the living room and I said, Dad, so what happens when you die? And he goes, well, you know, I'm just going to float around the air like everybody else does which is what Edgar Cayce taught, his parents being disciples of Edgar Cayce, a fortune teller, if you will. He was a computer guy. Uh, he worked on hardware before he wrote software. So I and what the Lord gave me was to relate these things to what he knew. I related the spirit and the flesh to computer software and computer hardware. Computer software has no mass. And so theoretically, it can't decay. It won't die. It's like the spirit, if you will, in an, an analogy. Uh, then hardware, computer hardware. Constant need of repair. And then it gets outdated. And then it becomes useless. Your laptop, 2015, it's outdated, right? Six years. You know, the technology curve's going like this. Hardware, it's like the flesh. And so I said, you know, God's software is the gospel of Jesus Christ for those who believe. And when you believe, you get new and never, ever out of date hardware. And he was in pain. He was, he was dying of cancer. I know he didn't feel well. He just sat there thinking, because that's what he did. He thought. And then he nodded and he goes, uh, that was very good, Doug. And I thought of King Agrippa. You almost persuaded me. I was bummed out. But then, you know, I said goodbye and 
just, I think two weeks later, I got a call from my older sister. Um, Dad was home. He was in bed, not responsive to voices in the family. He stopped eating. He wouldn't open his eyes. You know, he was shutting down. Everything was failing. And my sister said on the phone, "Uh, Dad's dying. If you have anything to say to him, this is your last chance. So I took the phone. I have no idea what I said. I was so numb. I still don't have any idea what I said. And hung up. Well, she called me back the next day. And she said, um, you know, I don't know what you said to Dad. But when he heard your voice, he opened his eyes, he sat up, and he listened. And then he wanted something to eat. Did my dad have an encounter with Jesus after I witnessed to him? I don't know. I have a hope, a confident expectation. Uh, So God is still working in all of our loved ones who do not believe, who have not bent their knee nor confessed with their tongue. God is still working. And so please don't ever give up. Keep sharing the word of God. Keep living the word of God. Keep sharing your personal testimony. Because we must not strive. As the servants of the Lord, we must not strive, but we must be gentle to all men, apt to teach, patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Those who do not believe that Jesus is the Christ are opposing themselves. They're kicking against the goads. We are to instruct them. Peradventure, God would give them the gift of repentance and to the acknowledging of the truth, that they would recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who has taken them captive at his will. You know, our personal testimonies, as was Paul's, our personal testimonies may not be liked. They will probably be mocked, but they can't be denied. And they were shared and shared faithfully by Paul before Festus and Agrippa, both of which answered tragically. But Paul was not responsible for their choice. They are responsible for their choice. We're not responsible for the choices of our loved ones. They're responsible for their choice. But we're responsible to know Jesus and to make him known. And we do that with many tears. Do we not? Verse 30. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they that sat with them. And when they had gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. The whole point of chapter 26 was to have Paul examined by Agrippa to help Festus write down a legal brief to send with Paul to Caesar. Well, he got no help. He got no help from Agrippa. Festus still got a problem. Okay, what do I send to Caesar about this guy? Uh, Well, what has he heard a couple of times? What could he say? Oh, well, he could write to Nero about the resurrection from the dead. He could write about Jesus of Nazareth. Well, he ain't going to do that. But here we have Paul. At the end of all this, he's under the protection of the Roman Empire who will protect him from his enemies. And they're going to take him to Rome which is exactly what Jesus said he was going to do. So God's will, God's way, much higher than our thoughts. But in chapter 26, we have the tale of two hearts resident in the life of every regenerated follower of Jesus Christ. Once a hard-hearted antichrist, supernaturally converted to a soft-hearted servant of Christ. And we hear the tale of two tragedies frequently. Oh, that's just nonsense. That's just crazy talk. Or, 
well, you almost had me there. That's good, but I'm not buying what you're selling. You know, following Jesus comes with many tears. Tears of joy and tears of agony. You know, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. If you're following Jesus, you found the narrow path that leads to life. Tears of joy. But we have people in our lives who aren't on that path. They're on the broad way that leads to destruction. Tears of agony. Jesus said to Nicodemus, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Tears of joy. For God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, tears of joy. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Tears of agony. But God... He is still working. Is he not? If you'll stand with me, please. What a joy and what a, a privilege it is to call you Father. We weren't your Father once, our Father was the devil. But there's been an intervention. There's been a brokenness at the foot of the cross, and we rejoice in that. And Father, now we lift up all our lost loved ones uh, who you died for. We didn't. You love them more than we do. And their, their stubbornness and the blindness of their mind, the blindness of their heart is heartbreaking to us, and we know it's heartbreaking to you. We're filled with questions. Will they come to the truth before they take their last breath on earth? Will they stop kicking the goads and bend their knee and confess that Jesus is the Christ? Before the rapture? After the rapture? After the rapture, so much danger, a strong delusion. Will they fall to the strong delusion? So, Father, we plead with you. Soften their hearts and embolden ours. And please, may they encounter Jesus. May you give to them what you've given to us. May you do for them what you've done for us, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.